I don't know who you are, but welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. Hello and you're very welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host this evening and this evening I've actually got somebody whose work I've admired from afar for a very long time. And, you know, we started to chat online and then I started to kind of watch more of his work and it inspired me. He's a great photographer, filmmaker, creator and somebody, like I said, that's inspired people worldwide. So without any further ado, welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast, Christoph Benfrey. How are you getting on, buddy? Good, yeah, it's good. To, happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. It's been, you know, a pleasure for me to have you on. I've been admiring your work for a long, long, long time, and you know, and we chatted every so often on uh, Instagram. And then I kind of said, you know what? Wouldn't he be a great guest to get on to kind of f- fulfill, I suppose, an idea that I've had, which is how much is involved in getting to the level and the quality what you're able to produce. And I know your photography started from a kind of a film point of view, but then you moved into filmmaking and I thought it fascinating. There was a number of things that you've been able to create and I'd love to know more. So that's why I invited you on. Thank you very, very, very much for coming on. And I suppose, you know, how's your day been so far? Anyway, before we get into anything photography, it's a Saturday afternoon, I believe, in Toronto, yeah? Yep, yeah, it's a rainy day here. Um, I'm just uh, I just got to my studio and it was actually there was like the most epic sunset that happened just <sighs> kind of in between rainfall and it went you know it was only lasted about three minutes or so but uh, mm-hmm. otherwise it's been a, a good good rainy day here yeah in Toronto. Did you have a camera on your hand when you saw that anybody chance? No, or? I was kicking myself because <laughs> I, I had my iPhone and I snapped a photo. But oh ah, yeah, okay, you, guys, yeah. you got a record shot of it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and it, you know it's interesting. You think you think that we always look to the sky you now and we look for light and light is basically what. Everything, I think, anyway, right now in, in different shades of light, intensity of light, the different types of light. And you're on the way to the studio and you're rushing in and all of a sudden you go, look at this light. Oh, so you got to go mm-hmm. get the shot. You can't, you can't turn it down. Like, you know what nope. I mean? It's great. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I suppose, you know, Christoph, like I mentioned, I alluded to, you know, I've been a fan of your work for a number of years. But just in case somebody doesn't know about you, who are you? Tell us a bit about you. Um, yeah, so my name's Christoph, and I'm, uh, I guess, a cinematographer by trade. So I mm-hmm. work on commercials and movies and music videos and things like that as the camera person and the lighting director, basically. Um, and then in my spare time, I also make content just for in- the internet, like for Instagram and for YouTube and stuff. And that's not necessarily paying the bills, but it's just a creative outlet that I have. Um, so they're two, you know fairly different but also connected things Mm -hmm. uh, and that I'm using the same tools it's just for really different uh, end products essentially. Mm -hmm. For sure yeah and you know how did you get started in the whole photography filmmaking genre or side of things in your in your creativity did it start with film and then move into video or was there a combination of both in the beginning? Yeah, I mean, the the beginning for me was a long time ago. Uh, my dad was always really into photography and filmmaking, but uh, he came from a family where basically everybody had to get a PhD or they weren't going to be successful in okay. life. So yep. he wasn't okay. able to pursue his creative endeavors the same way that I was, I was able to. But he instilled in me at a really young age this desire to make stuff with cameras. So um, when I was a kid, we would go on camping trips and he would buy me disposable cameras to play with Brilliant. to kind of just see what would happen. Um, and then he also had an old eight millimeter, um, film camera that you could do stop motion with. So I would do little animations with like my Lego (laughs) men basically. And so that was, you know, when I was under 10 years old, I was messing around with that stuff. Wow. Um, and then when I was a little bit older, when I was a teenager, I started skateboarding and, um, I wasn't as good as a lot of the people that I was skateboarding with. So I ended Mm -hmm. up picking up a camera and kind of approaching it from that angle and making skate videos and taking skate photos. Um, And then that was kind of my foray into the more professional world. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started getting stuff published um, with the skateboarding stuff. And then I had friends that were in bands and there was a a pretty easy crossover from skateboarding into the music video world. And then it just kind of, you know, went from there from, from that. But I've always wanted to do narrative stuff in a couple of years ago. Ago, I finally had the opportunity to start shooting feature films, which is kind of where, where I hoped I would end up, and, and wow. it was sort of, it's sort of happening. And did you think, you know, back in the day, you started off from a media, medium format film? Did you think that starting off on that, it would bring you to where you are right now? I suppose how has that 
influenced you to where you are right now from where you began, let's just say? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always been um, optimistic about where things would go. Um, but a lot of, you know, it's, you look at, especially when you're first starting out, you look at the difference in quality between what you're making and the people who you look up to. And there's a mm -hmm, huge, sure. you know, a huge gap in between. Um, mm -hmm. But I was always kind of maybe unrealistically optimistic that it was just going to work out. So the first, you know, 15 years of doing it, I wasn't making any money and I was just constantly pouring more money into staying on top of the, you know, the equipment that you need to be able to keep it sustainable. For sure. Um, especially with the last 10 years, how quickly everything's evolved, you know, equipment that you had two years ago is basically obsolete. <laughs> um, so it's an expensive hobby. Um, so yeah, oh, it was always sure. the dream to turn it into a profession. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it definitely doesn't seem that way when you're first starting out. It seems like such a, something that's so far away and you mm -hmm. kind of have to be a little bit crazy to expect that it's actually going to work out. But and did, did, did you find that there was a kind of a natural progression? You mentioned a second ago about going from filming with skateboarding and then that brings you into the music videos and the music videos brings you into others. And from that point of view, was it that you're going, wow, hang on, look back, four years ago I was doing this, but now today I'm doing that. And was it a four-year kind of a, a, a jump or was it a longer jump or was it a shorter jump? Did it kind of overnight go, wow, look what I'm doing? It definitely wasn't an overnight thing. I mean, I'm talking about like the first, I think the first thing I had published, I was about 15 years old. And I don't think I really actually made a living from it until probably 12 years after that point. Um, wow. So I always had a regular job you know, mm -hmm. to kind of support that addiction to the camera yes. stuff. Yes. Um, so it, does, it doesn't It does happen overnight. For some people it does, especially mm -hmm. now the technology is a lot more accessible. I think it, there's a quicker learning curve to everything. But for me, it was probably about the span of 12 years from kind of first getting my feet wet to actually being able to make it a profession. And putting in lots of hard work, lots of graft, lots of learning, lots of mistakes, mm -hmm. I imagine, in regards to what things, oh, hang on, I want to do it better, but you get it better right away, and then you don't make that mistake again, and that's where you kind of, the evolution of your skill set, I imagine, would come from, but then what you produce on the other end of that, did you start to kind of think of that as well from an evolutionary point of view? Yeah, I can film it now, but it's now mm -hmm. how I'm filming it. I got to make it polished. I mean, you're, you're legendary from the, your attention to detail, let's just say, from the filming point of view. So was that something that you kind of realized early on, if I'm going to do this, do it well, do it right, mm -hmm. make it look as best as it can be. Yeah, there was kind of a defining moment for me with that. Um, when I was first doing the skateboarding photography stuff, there was actually a website called skateboardphotography.com okay. where you could upload your work. So, and then people would critique it and you had, you know, I remember like a few, like Atiba Jefferson and Jay Grant Britton and some really well-known skateboard photographers were members on this forum. This okay. was before Facebook and everything. So the forums were the place where you would do Old this school, kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and they would basically rip your work to pieces. <laughs> so like a photo that you thought was pretty good, you would upload it. And then all of a sudden they'd be pointing out all of the flaws. Okay. And I think that left a really lasting impression on me. Like I still can remember some of the comments that I got on very specific <laughs> wow. photos. Wow. Um, and so it just kind of uh, instilled in you this drive to, you know, to make something that people can't really pick apart. And that's mm -hmm. basically impossible. I don't think that is something that ever goes away. But it's just, you know, having that on the back of your mind. And, and at least if you know it's there, then when somebody else points it out, sometimes it makes it hurt a little bit less because you're like, mm -hmm. okay, I knew that was there. It just got to the point where I had to, you know, close the book on this one and put it out there and move on to the next thing. So with that in mind, I suppose, and if you're filming right now, like how much attention to detail will you go into knowing what your output needs to be? So preparation, I think, is a very, very important part of you, you know, a point of view, sorry. The execution is equally as important, if not more important, but the vision of how the whole thing should look is something which holds the whole glue together. So are you looking at something and how you want this to look at at the very, very end and what steps you have to make to get it to look that way, albeit from a equipment point of view or an execution or a post-processing or an editing. Is it that kind of level of detail that you go into? I imagine it is, but um, to make it look as good as it can be. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, um, I think uh, a lot of times I'll shoot something three or four times before I end up actually you know, putting it out there for people to see. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then sometimes you, you kind of get lucky with something that's just like a, 
an idea that you haven't really fleshed out and you're able to kind of fix it up in post and make it into something. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely over scrutinize my work and also myself. So whenever I make a YouTube video, like the people that I share a studio with kind of know this about me that I'll probably shoot it four or five times. Mm -hmm. Like all of the talking stuff, I'll edit a complete video and then scrap the whole thing and start from oh. scratch. Um, just and it's not even that the final product ends up being this amazing thing it's just like i you know i get hung up on you know little things that kind of just bug me um so i think yeah i mean sometimes you just want to make something that you i mean i guess it probably goes back to the people picking apart my work on that skateboard photography website i'm trying mm -hmm. to mitigate as much of that as possible mm -hmm. and um and anyone who makes content you know you know you're your own worst critic and you're oh, yeah. seeing little things that nobody else is going to notice but um but it's hard to not you know to kind of get past that and just be happy with something and and put it out there for everyone else to judge yeah so you know with that in mind here's a question for you right so if you're filming something and like have you got the music that you want to put in mind are already picked before you start filming that? Or is it something that you film it and then you look for the music? Because what I find is that I do this, I find the music and I all of a sudden I go, wow, this is matching the beats that I wanted it to be. It's like as if there were a match made in heaven. But then there might be something I go, actually, you know what? I don't like the music because a certain part of this. And I might end up changing the music, which means now I have to change the whole beat to cut or cut to beat and everything else that I've done. But would you go then so far as to say that you'd actually go back and f film something again if it wasn't right for what you visioned for the, and the editing suite I might have changed to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, music is, plays such a crucial role in especially the kind of stuff that I put on Instagram because it's a really short, repetitive thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's usually about a five or six second clip that's looping over and over again. So you want mm -hmm. something that isn't going to get annoying after the third or fourth or tenth play. Yes. Um, but a yeah, it's very rare that I actually find the music first. Usually I shoot something and then I kind of, you know, do a rough edit. Um, and then I'll, I'll try and find a song that fits the, you know, the mood of whatever that clip is. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll spend, like, I'll scrap projects if I can't find the right song for it. I'll have wow. stuff, like, the, there's a thing that I just posted a, a couple weeks ago of, like, a BMW, it, like, loops around. And I mm -hmm. had that, I shot that clip over a year ago, but I never really finished it and I never because I couldn't find the right song for it um so yeah usually it's very rare that I I pick the song uh before I shoot something usually I shoot it and then I kind of you know figure out what it's going to look like and then I try and find a song that'll fit that and I could spend days looking for one little five second piece of a, a song yeah. um so music yeah music is so integral isn't it really because it takes you on the beat but it also gives you like we'll talk about it later on I suppose in regards to loops but it's really, really important that you can have that, that you keep the audience engaged, but that even don't even realize it to a certain extent. Wow, I've mm -hmm. listened to the same loop here 10 times. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it has been 10 times. And that's, I think, where the beauty and the magic comes into the visual connection, yeah. the auditory connection, and then the emotional connection that the two of those can create, not only for the creator, but who is also watching it. Yeah, crazy, and I take a lot it? of insp in that regard. I take a lot of inspiration from like hip hop because that's basically hip hop was built on taking you know a four or five second clip of mm -hmm. a song, you and know repeat. the best four or five seconds, and then repeating that and making an entire song out of it. So for sure, it's not that it it, it, it can definitely work. Um, and you're usually taking the catchiest five seconds of that song, so mm -hmm. it's kind of you're getting the best you know the best little bit of it. But uh, but yeah, it's it's tricky to just you know you, you spend a lot of time looking for that perfect song. Well, for sure, yeah. And, you know, like something else, like you mentioned at the outset there, you know, you've worked in movies, you've worked in music videos and such like that. A music video, I think, is going to be different from working from a movie. It's also going to be different from working from a short film or a conceptual idea that you want to turn into a short film because the music is the driver for the music video. So you're having to shoot the video to match whatever storytelling is going on mm -hmm. with the music and with the vocals and such like that. So that's kind of a reversal then from the creativity point of view because you're filming to match the, to match the music, to match the, yeah. the, the, the message of the music and such like that, yeah? Yeah, it's like the opposite of a music video, basically. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of the, even like the short films that I've worked on, um, it, the music has always played a huge role in the content that I make, no matter you know what, if it's a looping video for Instagram or if it's a short film or if it's a music video, then obviously music is a huge component. Or even the feature films that I've worked on, um, like two out of the four features that I've shot so far have had a huge music component to them. So yeah, I don't think that's an accident. I think it's definitely something that I look for in a project. 
And, you know, speaking of that, I suppose, in, in the many of the projects that you would have worked on over the years, I know it's hard to kind of get, ask you a question. Have you got a favorite project that you've worked on? It's like trying to say, okay, which is your favorite child or which is your favorite pet if you have multiple pets? But because every single one of them that you've worked on, I imagine you've left part of you within that because your creation mm-hmm. and everything else has gone into it. But do you have a kind of a favorite that you've worked on over the years? And is there something specific as to why? I think um, right now the the my favorite thing I've ever worked on, and incidentally you can watch it on YouTube. Thankfully, is a, a short film called Chesterfield, um, just because it was a really small uh, crew of like some of my favorite people that we got to make it with. I really loved the story uh, and the message that it was left, and you know, we were able to do a lot with a very with very little on that one. Um, and just as an overall finished product, it's something I'm the most pleased with. And mm-hmm. you can actually watch it. So it's something that people, like a lot of the things that I've shot, um, people don't get to see them for a year or two because it gets stuck in festival land or whatever. Um, but this is something that people can actually go and finally watch. So yeah, Chesterfield is by far my favorite thing. And and do you like it from what you filmed? Do you like it from what you produced? Or do you like it from the memories that it leaves you with, from the people, as you say, that you filmed it with? I think... People are a big, big part of everybody's life. But when it comes to creativity, everybody brings their own piece to it. And then ultimately, it's like as if you have the kind of the dream team. Is that mm-hmm. kind of a, a good synopsis yeah, of it? You hit the nail on the head with that one. It was all it was all three of those things combined. It was a really good group of people to be collaborating with. Uh, it was an awesome project and you know story to, to be able to tell. Um, and I look back very fondly on, on the time that we spent making that movie and then the time we spent editing it and everything like that, too. Yeah, brilliant. You know, and I think that's that's an interesting point because, like, how much when you when I've watched some of your movies and some of your short films and stuff like that, it's been head and shoulders above what I've seen in the past, I suppose, right? And there's a number of different things that you would have done, and we'll talk about it again later on. I've already alluded to it, which is from the loop point of view. But you did a couple of um, items there with the, like the Insta Insta three hundred and sixty camera and such like that, and I remember looking at it going, number one, division, number two the technical ability to be able to do that. Number three, to be able to put the whole lot together, but not only put it together, but also to keep it going forever from mm-hmm. the whole loop point of view, you know? So like, how doesn't a typical idea come about right up as far as execution? I know it's probably not an easy one because everything is different, but just that example, I suppose, maybe with a 360 camera, where did that come from? Where did the, the it's, it just blew me away, man. It just blew yeah. me away. Uh, well, that's one of the things like I feel like it's almost cheating a little bit when you get your hands on something that's relatively new technology. So 360 cameras and drones and it's stuff that not everybody can just, you know, grab and, and use. So mm-hmm. you kind of uh, it gives you a little bit more opportunity to create something that somebody hasn't seen yet, um, which is which is really cool. Um, and um I don't really know where those ideas come from. A lot of times it's, you know, it starts off as like a much simpler idea. And then while I'm in the field shooting something, you know, you you kind of accidentally stumble across something else. And then one thing leads to another and you sort of have this cool new thing. Um, And most of the time in terms of the technical aspect, uh, going into making those clips, I actually have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) Um, But, but you learn along the way and that's like the coolest. And I, and you know, my Instagram originally started as a place where I would just kind of test ideas to pitch to be music videos or to pitch to be uh, other things. Um, so it was kind of a, a testing ground for those kinds of things. So I would kind of get a new piece of equipment or find a cool location and uh, just go and, you know, and try and make something as like a proof of concept, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, by slowly building an audience, it actually became a place where I could make stuff specifically just for um for instagram rather than it just being a testing ground but i think that that idea of testing ideas is kind of what's remained the same the whole time with um what i post on instagram so yeah usually i have no idea what i'm doing and it's only through the process of actually making that clip that i kind of learn something um about how to do it and then i can continue to build on it yeah it just blew me away man seriously i mean it was just like looking it was completely something that i hadn't even thought of and i was thinking Number one, like I said, how did he actually do this? I mean, I had a, I had an Insta 360 at the time as well. I've since moved it on, but because I wouldn't have used it as often as I thought it was going to use, and I always considered, mm-hmm. oh, this is great, but is it a kind of a gimmicky thing that you kind of, all right, I might get this angle, that, but no, it's not because I've seen what you've been able to create with it, and it, without something like that, 
it's actually near impossible, I imagine, mm. to be able to create things that you've done. And not only that, but it, you're telling a story throughout the whole thing as well. And it, it's never ending because, again, again we, we've already alluded to it this third time we'll talk about. But, yeah. you know, from a loop point of view, it's not just one sequence. It's a mm-hmm. sequence that has a start and a finish, which is mm-hmm. the start and the finish. And yeah. that just... <laughs> blew me away you know I mean I was like how did he come up with this but not only ah, okay I have to know so how did you, do you know what I mean so that's interesting mm-hmm. you kind of give it that it comes up and it evolves as it goes along too yeah because a lot of times when you're like I was saying before I'll shoot something three or four times but before I actually post it so that idea probably started as something much more simple and then I would finish editing something but in the process of like learning that and editing it I would come up with something that mm-hmm. built on that a little bit more and I was like oh well, I can't post this now if I'm just going to go and redo it with this like a slight bit better and then you don't you do that three or four times and then that's when you end up with you oh. know something like that particular video oh, fantastic work I have to say you know hats off I mean it was really kind of I think it was probably one of the first ones actually where I first had to message you and I went, okay, I have to tell him how good this is, man, because like it is unbelievable. All the other stuff I would have seen you've done, I've you know the usual, you give it a heart and you go, okay, this is great, but that just blew me away, and I went, no, oh, awesome. I have to, Thank I have you. to tell him that, you know. And I suppose something else, I suppose the last question before we go for a quick break, I suppose is, you know, you film for the edit. And that's a concept, I suppose. Does that come from a filmmaking point of view for the movies? Because obviously, you know, you're, you, have to mo- you have to film for what the edit need is needed. But mm-hmm. like, when I'm, for example, vlogging, I'm not filming necessarily for the edit. I'm filming for what I'm doing in the field. It might be by a cliff. It might be by the sea. I'm mm-hmm. thinking, OK, actually, you know what? This might be a nice bit to, fil- to film from this moving out to the camera because it'll give me a bit of B-roll to move into the next scene. But yeah. your stuff is leagues and head and shoulders and every other part above that from what I can see because you're filming something knowing where you need it to start at the mm-hmm. beginning or the end of the next one. Yeah. Yeah, and that honestly, uh, it comes from being a lazy editor. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> like my least favorite thing to do is go through tons and tons of footage and, you know, figure out the story after the fact. Mm-hmm. I would way rather spend that time before, you know, making making or filming as much or as little as possible sorry so that there's as little editing to do as possible because i would way rather be out there shooting um than than sitting behind the computer uh so a lot of times and that's you know even the looping videos it kind of comes down to that i I really only have to shoot one thing and though i kind of have the idea in my head going into the edit so it's you kind of have an idea of how long it's going to take but Mm -hmm. um but yeah i'm I'm not actually a great editor at the end of the day and uh (sighs) So it, it so that that whole idea of shooting specifically for the edit just comes from being a lazy editor and wanting to make as little work for myself as possible. Well, yeah, it's it's incredible. It's incredible. All right. So look, what I'll do is we'll take a very very quick break and uh, we'll be sure. right back after this. Sounds good. So. Hey guys, this is Nick Page from the Landscape Photography Podcast, and you are listening to the Irish Photography Podcast. They don't yeah, see well, it's like the, whole, the saying, the rising tide raises all ships kind of a thing, right? If you help other people out, it's, you know, it's going to help everybody ultimately. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. I, I want more people here. Um, I, I think mm-hmm. it's amazing, actually. We mentioned there about, sorry, I, I'm still, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, <laughs> Christoph, okay. right? Um, but we, I might include some of it. We'll see if we can cut it in afterwards. Sure. But I think, yeah. you know, a like guy's mentioned about the north of England and landscape photography vloggers. Canada and video creators... What is it? I mean, like, Jesus Christ, Something guys. in the water, I guess, eh? <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, I think, uh, I mean, maybe we should pick things up again here because I think yeah. that is something that I've thought about a lot. And I think it comes down to the mentality here. It's not cutthroat the way it is in some other places, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, people here want to collaborate. And, you know, some of the people with bigger audiences want to bring the people with smaller audiences under their wings, so to speak, mm-hmm. to kind of like... Uh, help other people see their content. So I think that's part of the reason why there's like such a concentration of successful content creators here is like, we're all helping each other out and uh, sharing each other's work too. Like if, if something inspires me, I'm the first to, to share it because I'm like, you know, it's not something I made, but it's like showing people something that inspires sure. me because I think people are interested in seeing that. Yes. Um, but it is interesting. Cause like within probably a 200 kilometer radius, there's like, several dozen <laughs> fairly successful content creators. But yes. if you look at them, it's like 
we all follow each other. We all, you know, are fans of each other and we're like seeing each other's work. So I think that's yeah. what it is, is, you know, people sharing the wealth, so to speak. Yeah, and, and, and to create that that sense of community and support. And I think that's the support, mm-hmm. which is the biggest part, because if you know that you're doing well, great. But you never know you're doing well until you actually see, wow, mm-hmm. that's that's actually good. And when your friends are telling you, you know what, Christoph, that's actually really, really good. You're like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it was good, but is it really? <laughs> yeah, it's really, yeah. really good. It's you nice know, to that. get affirmation from people who you look up to, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So I suppose uh, moving on to something I alluded to three times there in the first part, okay? So it's something mm-hmm. that I'm really excited to talk to you about and I get a bit more into your head, I suppose, where the concept, for again, I could say concept, idea, execution comes from, which is perfect loop, infinite loop. There are two mm-hmm. things I'd associate with you, and I suppose for me, it's just pure awesome. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Like, come on, tell me a bit more. Where, 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 where did this come from? Where did the idea come from? And like, perfect loop, infinite loop. Mm-hmm. Tell me. Sure, yeah. I mean, I can't remember where I... Because, I mean, I obviously didn't come up with the idea of a perfect sure. loop video. Um, and I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the first thing that I saw was that kind of inspired me to go in that direction with it. But mm-hmm. definitely... Um, just the, the fact that Instagram is, you know, the way the video is laid out is it does automatically start again. It doesn't just, you know, like TikTok, it doesn't scroll to the next video after you mm-hmm. finish it. It kind mm-hmm. of means it's the perfect um, platform to share that kind of content. Uh, and I've always liked the idea of making something that kind of sucks people in and you forget that you've watched it a bunch of times and maybe you can't figure out where it starts and where it ends. Um, and so I just kind of decided to like, double down on the whole perfect loop thing and make that my thing. Um, and then it forces you, it's like a box that you're contained within where you're like, you know, if you're, if you're coming up dry with ideas, at least you have a starting point. You're like, okay, I know that I want this video to start and end at the same place. And that, like, how do I build on that? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then, you know, the nice thing is that just the fact that it's looping makes it something that people will watch over and over again, which is what you want at the end of the day as a content creator. You want people to, you know, kind of be mesmerized by your work. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's kind of where it came from. And, you know, it keeps you on your toes in terms of coming up with new ideas that kind of incorporate, you know, the perfect loop thing into them. And, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, seriously, it's incredible. And, I, you know, the question I have for you is when you, from the first frame, Mm-hmm. to the last frame like i said earlier the first frame is the last frame the last frame is the first frame so mm-hmm. the journey in between is where you're taking the audience and such like yeah. that but to get to the f- to get at the very end to be the last frame to be the same as the first frame you have to have mm-hmm. this thought out the whole way through yeah for sure so like when you're doing that then like you use different tools to be able to do that. So yeah, I mentioned earlier, I alluded to, you know, the Insta360. That, that's one you say, okay, I can utilize that. I can bring that back around and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. you've also now, not now, you may have been doing it for a while actually, but you've been doing it with drones. Mm-hmm. And not only them doing it with drones, but also racing drones. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, man, like just exactly that. Where is the start? Where is the mm-hmm. end? And it just blew me away. And then, you know, you you, you did a video. I, I kind of mentioned it when we were having our intro conversation before starting recording, but you did a video recently. And you also explained to people mm-hmm. how you do this. Yep. And even at that, I'm looking, as you're explaining it, I'm going, Jesus, man, this is just incredible. Incredible. The thought process the whole way through. So, like, with that in mind, I suppose, from a drone point of view, how does that change it? Like you've mm-hmm. done some like, incredible stuff with the drone. Yeah, like a lot of times um, the the f- initial idea for something comes from seeing somebody who did something uh, and I'm like hoping it'll be a perfect loop and then it's not. And then mm-hmm. so I'll like see that and I'll be like, okay, how can I? So the, the, my most recent thing with the buildings, like flying through the buildings and seeing the, the road below and then you mm-hmm. pan up and you see. So I mm-hmm. saw somebody, he goes by Coffee Liquor on Instagram. He did a thing uh, where he flies between two buildings and then he edited a different shot of like the 
the top down of the road. And I was just like, I just wanted it to pan up and see those two buildings again. And it didn't. So I was like, okay, well, that's a, a way for me to build on, you know, a really cool concept that somebody else came up with. Um, and the cool thing about the perfect loop too, is you can decide where you want the beginning and the end to be, because it can be anywhere in that, you know, 15 or 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so you can choose like, okay, like, do I want to surprise people by the fact that this is going to be a perfect loop or, you know, right from the outset, do you want them to see where, you know, the end is coming and how it's going to, you know, turn back around again. Um, and so it kind of, yeah, it opens up some doors to kind of uh, how you want to present that to people. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. And on any of that, but you also do a kind of a, an inception aspect as well of it, where you're seeing the next frame coming from it, and you're moving to that next frame, and you're like, what yeah. am I looking at the first time? But then as you realize it, it's what you've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really satisfying as like a, both as a, because I, I mean, obviously I follow that perfect loop hashtag. So I see other stuff that people are making and mm -hmm. it's really satisfying when you catch on to the fact that it's, a, you know, about to loop perfectly. So like uh, both as a creator and as a, as a audience member, I love, I love that uh, concept. Yeah. You know what? I mean, look, o overall for me, it's something I actually would love to learn how to do, but I'd love to be able to have the ability to think about it in the first place to how I actually could shoot something like that i mean mm -hmm. from a tools point of view i mean look in reality we talk so much now and there's so much talk these days about equipment and gear and stuff like that and we'll get into that in another part of the podcast later on but there's no such thing as a bad camera these days it's, even yeah. like the technology that we have right now we are spoiled i mean you go back as you mentioned earlier five years ago ten years ago that technology is defunct but even as we are right now Mm -hmm. There's nothing bad. Everything is incredible. And what you can produce with this, mm -hmm. it's limitless in reality, I think, yeah? Oh, yeah. Like the, the, it's crazy what we have access to. And for a relatively affordable price, you know, these days, like for, for under $1,000, you can have a camera that's better than anything anyone had to work with five years ago. Yeah. So there really isn't an excuse to, you know, not being able to make something. Like you can even get drones for a couple hundred bucks now. Yeah. You know? And so there's like literally, if you have an idea for something, you're not limited by the access to the equipment. There's, there's really no excuse to... Uh, yeah, for sure. And it, just to touch on the drone there, and again, actually, because I wanted to go into more information a moment ago, and I kind of got distracted by the beauty of the infinite loop, right? So from the racing drone's point of view, as you say, like you have one there. I saw a video clip that you did, which was on a creek, and you were mm -hmm. flying, obviously, with a, a goggles on, I imagine, when you yeah. were doing that, yeah? Yeah. Tell me a bit more about that. I've never used the goggles. I, is it mm -hmm. something that is integral to allow you to be able to fly a racing drone at the pace that it's able to fly. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, I've been flying regular, like they call them GPS drones for mm -hmm. probably about seven years now. And I just picked up the FPV thing this January. Um, and it's a completely different flying experience. Uh, just like the proximity that you fly to things and the speed that you do it at isn't possible with GPS drones because they have all these sensors that are basically mm -hmm. preventing you from, you know, colliding with things. And the whole thing that makes the FPV thing so interesting is the fact that it constantly feels like you're going to collide with something, but you're able to <laughs> kind of just, just get out of that situation, you know, at right at the nick of time. Um, and the only way that they're able to do that is the, it's like a lower latency than what the DJI drones have. So the, the quality is lower, but the, the speed that the signal from the camera on the drone gets to you as the pilot is almost instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what allows you to kind of you know, fly so close to things. And then with the, with putting the goggles on, it's, you're fully immersed. Like you literally feel like you're sitting in the cockpit of, or you're a bird flying mm. in it. And, uh, and so, you know, that's just another thing that allows you to fly so close to things without hitting them. Cause you, you really actually feel like you're in the driver's seat when you wear the goggles. It's, it's like a completely different experience. Wow. And like, every time I take, like my wife, we were in California this year and she could tell when I had come back from flying because I just have this permanent smile on my face <laughs> that you can't wipe off because it's just, it's so exhilarating. Um, and I mean like flying regular drones is super fun. And, um, but like flying the FPV drones, it's like, even if I don't come back with any sort of content from going out and flying, it's just like, I'll just go and fly for the, the fun of flying. Yeah. Um, cause it's, it's so much fun, but yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, the goggles are definitely an integral aspect to that. Cause if you're, you know, it completely takes over your entire field of view and you can see everything and react in real time. Yeah. It's incredible. Like as you say, it must be very immersive to have it 
right here. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, enough people aren't watching it, but if you imagine my my finger, yeah. my hands are around my eyes, right? VR like goggles, but, yeah, yeah. But not only for making it, but when I'm watching it as well, I have that exact same sensation because you get such an incredible sense of pace and speed and proximity with the mm-hmm. movement of whatever it is is following past on the the camera. So, like. Is that a drone that you would have built yourself? Is it something that's an off-the-shelf racing drone? Did you put a GoPro Hero 8, Hero 7, Hero mm-hmm. 6, whatever? What, what did you do f- to be able to get that kind of footage that you've done with that? Yeah, so the um, the FPV racing drone world um, is still very new, I think, in terms of, at least from a consumer point of view. Like, I think there's guys that have been doing it for a few years, um, maybe like even six or seven years. But in terms of being accessible to people like me, uh, it's really the last like year or so that the the technology has gotten to a point where uh, it's like a, a lot more accessible. So you used to have to build these things like they didn't sell them off the shelf. Yes. Um, but even in the last, I would say the last year or so, now you can buy ready to fly ones that connect to the DJI digital FPV system. You know, so with the, the click of a few buttons, you're up in the air. That being said, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to crash and have to rebuild the thing. So having a knowledge of how to put it back together is really useful. Um, The one that I used in that specific shot is one that uh, was a ready to fly one that I bought um, Ah, right right off of website. So it showed up, you know, I paired it with my goggles and my controller and it was ready to go. But um, I have about six or seven of them now. I've built three of them myself and then the other ones were off the shelf ones. And I always say to people who are just getting started in the FPV hobby to, to buy a ready to fly one and just take a really good look at it when it shows up before you crash it. So you kind of have an understanding, you know, take a bunch of pictures if you have to, um, because you will have to, you will have to put it back together. And, And they're, they're actually fairly simple. There's not a lot of components. You know, you basically have, you know, two microchips that control the flight and the motors. You have the motors themselves and you have the air unit, which is like what sends the feed back to the, the goggles. So, so they're actually quite easy to put back together um and if you buy one that was put together by a professional in the first place it's going to be a lot easier to rebuild it versus something that you kind of frankenstein yourself you know with really messy soldering and you know all of that so i do recommend going the route of buying one that either getting somebody to build one for you or buying one that's pre-built um so that at least you can get flying and kind of get the hang of it before because you want to pull your hair out when you start doing the rebuilding stuff and it might turn you off the hobby before you even get started so yeah for sure I, I have a friend of mine actually, and uh, Nick. He lived in Ireland, but he moved to Canada. Oh. Canada again, like you know. And he <laughs> he's gone straight into the FP, FPVs, and he's actually quite good at it as well from an urban nice. environment and areas like yeah. that. But I remember us watching as well. Were you involved when Matty and Matty were trying to put the uh, FPV together and make one themselves? And I think it was interesting to see the two of them come up with it and then crash it and then put it mm-hmm. back together again and then have back overheating the issues. Board. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and see, that's that video is actually a perfect example of the frustration that you'll get going into it because, um, and especially like even a few months ago when they made that video, there wasn't a lot of stuff on the internet about how to, to rebuild them. I think even in the last three or four months, that's changed. You know, pretty much anything you want to be able to do to rebuild it, you can find a video for it now, but that's mm-hmm. all popped up in the last half year or so. Um, but yeah, they, they perfectly depicted the frustration of trying to build and rebuild yeah. FPV drones. And that's why I just say time after time, like buy one that's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But good advice. Take the picture how it's supposed to look. So when yeah. it does fall to pieces, you know, where it's going to come back to together. Yeah, no, brilliant, brilliant. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, look, I think that whole aspect of it has been fantastic to be able to watch. But as you explained here, how to make it, but even film it. I think mm-hmm. it's going to be it's exhilarate, exhilarating. It's something I might look into myself because I do enjoy drone and I do enjoy having drone footage in my own videos. But mm-hmm. this is a different league altogether. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I might highly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, I might try to give it a go. And I suppose you know nice. from a from something that has really inspired me and to get I want to talk to touch on something here briefly, which is recently I watched um, uh, a short film released by one and only Mr. Peter McKinnon, and I went wow. Look at this. This is incredible. And then all of a sudden, I see, hang on a second. What? No way. Christoph. No way. He's filmed. Wow. Oh, my God. I I have to find out more. So, yeah. Tell me. This is just, it was brilliant, brilliant piece of footage. And not only one piece of footage, but overall, it was just brilliant. Tell me a bit more. Mm -hmm. That was great. Yeah, that was a, a really cool opportunity. And this is an example of, you know, um, I didn't even realize that 
Peter had was following me at the time um, and he reached out because he'd seen a, a piece of content that I made just for fun of like circling uh, my friend Florence um, and um, I guess he had this video that he had to make for DJI um, and he was really busy at the time so he didn't have a lot of a lot of time to put something together um, and it worked out because it was a video that I've had on the back of my mind for a long time okay. and uh, going back to how I like to um, shoot things as a proof of concept like pretty much everything in that video was stuff that I would shot previously and never really done anything with and so okay. when this opportunity came it was a perfect you know chance to kind of take these ideas that we'd had and use them for something that people were actually going to see um, so, you know, the, the running through the forest stuff, if you really go back deep into my Instagram, you'll find a similar video. Um, and same with the fire spinning stuff. I shot a music video years ago that never saw the light of day, but there's, if you look, go way back in my Instagram, you'll see some fire spinning stuff. Um, and so it was a cool opportunity to be able to, you know, put all of these ideas that were on the back burner for a long time into something that people were actually going to see. Um, so yeah, it was a, a crazy opportunity. I was really excited because... Um, a lot of times you get calls to do, you know, something like this and it's a really great opportunity, but it feels a little bit out of your wheelhouse maybe. Um, and mm -hmm. this was not one of those things. This was like, as soon as he shot me the message, I was like, yes, I'm on board. I have the perfect like yes. locations and people in mind to call. And so we kind of just hit the ground running and, uh, and put phenomenal. that together. And it was, yeah, it was awesome. It was really it was fun phenomenal. Time. I, there's, there's so much within the whole thing that I was so impressed with. And you mentioned about the running through the forest scene and such like that. And I saw the kind of the, the behind the scenes version, I suppose, in regards to when Peter took off and he mm. took off, you know, oh, yeah. and Florence took <laughs> off. And that was yeah. like, Wow, man, they're gunning it through this woods. Yeah, like. Peter put everybody to shame with his ability to run through the forest in really skinny jeans. It was like, it was something <laughs> to behold. <laughs> um, like, I can't keep up with Florence when I'm running with them. Like, when we did the first video, they had no trouble staying ahead of me, and they had to kind of pace themselves. Um, but Peter was like, he took off, and he was just gone. And, like, Florence had to uh, really, like, step it up a notch to keep up with with him yeah, yeah it that was, was phenomenal fun. phenomenal and i suppose jumping then over to the other location that you had from the recording there which was the old i think it was at a warehouse or a, mm -hmm. an old industrial building but there was a catacomb or something was that in the same building as upside down and you, you go down the steps into the catacomb yep. areas underneath like that whole location did you did you find that location was that a location that you had already got in because that to me was like look at it the lighting mm -hmm. is beautiful i mean this oh it was just <laughs> Yeah, so that's actually the future home of our new studio. Um, uh -huh. And I did a whole, I released a whole video back in August kind of explaining, you know, that project and what mm -hmm. it's going to become because it's going to be our studio, but it's also going to be uh, hopefully a oh, hub for filmmakers actually, in, yeah, in yeah, Toronto. Yeah, 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 yeah so that's, yeah. That same, that's that same building. Um, and it just happens to have these really cool tunnels. It's an old hydro building. Um, and uh, it, was, it was one of the first hydro buildings in North America. So they have a really cool cellar space and they have these, these tunnels where I guess they used to run... Uh, conduit for power um, and um, and that was one of the things that I wanted to show off because uh, um, when it comes to gimbals I think there is like I'm not a huge fan of gimbals myself but they are an essential tool to have in your toolkit and there's certain mm -hmm. instances where it's just the only thing that'll that'll do the job um, and you actually can't physically fit in those tunnels with a, a full-size cinema gimbal um, so that was something that we wanted to show uh, how the smaller, you know, the new Ronin, how it's smaller, but it can still handle high quality cameras on it in a, in a situation where that would be, because uh, that's the, the whole thing about the videos. We wanted to do these gimbal shots where it's like the RS2 is the only tool that you could do this with. Mm -hmm. So like running through a forest at full speed, you can't do that. If you have a giant gimbal, you know, with a big camera and the, and the red, you just can't run like that. Um, and going in these tunnels is another example where you can't, you need to have something small and compact mm -hmm. um, to get a shot that you couldn't do, you know, handheld or with mm -hmm. any other tool. So, yeah, that was all at the, the future home of our, our new studio. Yeah, fantastic looking location. And I think you're absolutely, as you say there, like you'd see the imaging of Peter with the whole rig on trying to go down the steps and you couldn't get mm -hmm. into the steps. Never mind, say, like you were filming that almost in pitch darkness. So the, the guy was running towards you, you. Was it you he was running towards with the it flame? Was, some of it was Peter, some of it was me. Yeah, we were we were taking turns. Yeah. Wow, man, he's running towards you with the flame, and you're running backwards yeah. in the complete darkness. He can't see you. No. You can't see behind. I mean, that is just like okay, let's do it, let's go. And I mean, like, yeah. how did that feel? Even 
doing that and filming it, but then seeing what came out in the other end, we'd go, oh, yeah, man, mm. we nailed it. It was great. Oh, yeah. The, the first thing we shot for that video was all the stuff with the fire spinner. That was basically the whole first day of shooting was was with him. And uh, I just remember, like, at the end of that day, we were, like, looking at each other, like, how are we going to top this? <laughs> like, nothing. <laughs> we did the breakdancing stuff and the forest stuff and the BMX stuff the next day. And it just, we were like, this video could be just the fire spinner and we would be satisfied. Yeah, yeah um, it, was beautiful. it was super exhilarating. It was so much fun. Like, it was one of those moments where you're like, I feel very grateful to be able to do what I get, what I do for a living. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose I just want to touch on one final thing in regards to that that shoot, which is a scene I loved because it kind of brought you full circle. I think from what I see with you with the whole perfect loop as well, which was you filmed mm -hmm. Peter with the full rig walking along and then coming past the pillar, and it changes into the Ronan mm -hmm. rig. But you didn't do it just ordinarily that way. You put your spin in it, and then you made it into the infinite loop. And I looked yeah. at it and went, "Ah, oh, man, this is just <laughs> yeah." It was a perfect. You know? It was a perfect opportunity to kind of like merge our two, um, you know, like filmmaking approaches together. So like they got what they needed for their DJI video, and I got a perfect loop out of it, which is yeah, um, yeah. So that was cool. And you you filmed that on the one wheel, is it? So you were going along oh, yeah. next to Peter yeah. with the one wheel, yeah. Yeah, I was on the one wheel. Yeah, it's the best way to get. If you can't use a gimbal, it's the you know the next best thing yeah, for smooth you, shots. And do you, do you use a one wheel from a day to day basis, or do you use it just as a kind of an additional tool from the filming point of view? Yeah, I um, both like my friend Jesse, who I share a studio with, and I we use them to go everywhere. Like we, you know, if it's a nice day, we'll use it. To, or even if it's not a nice day, we'll use it to get to and from home in the studio. Uh, I use them on set all the time on music music videos and movies and things like that. So it's both an essential tool as a, like a filmmaker in my toolkit, mm -hmm. but I also use it as a mode of transportation. I think I've got like 3,000 kilometers on, wow. on my XR. <laughs> wow. So yeah, I, you know, that's not just, you know, that's obviously, more, I use it as a commuter vehicle. I yeah, use it to go sure. to the train to get to Toronto and all kinds of things like that, yeah. Yeah. So, so holding a camera and then just filming with that was not even anything extra because you're so innately used to traveling on the one wheel anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and they—they they mean they're super intuitive in how you control them. So you know, once you kind of get the hang on it, it's—it's it's not long before you feel comfortable holding a camera while riding it. So, yeah. and that's well. the nice thing about that over like the scooter and stuff is you have your hands free to you know hold a camera or do whatever you want to do. So, oh, yeah. what's the other ones called? Uh, uh, typical skate well, boosted board or something like that yeah. is that what they're called yeah like it, it, have you ever been tempted i was before the one wheel um but the problem with the boosted board is the i mean you have the controller which to me feels unintuitive because you, you hit the button with your finger and then all of a sudden it goes and it's mm -hmm. not you're not leaning in this you know and uh and so a lot of people's first time they get on a boosted board they hit the button and then they go flying yeah <laughs> um so i like the one wheel just because it's you don't need to use a controller it's it's so much more intuitive um and once you get the hang of it it's like you forget you're riding it it just becomes an extension of your body yeah and plus you've two hands free as opposed to just and one. And you got your hands free, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, look, I really, really you know, appreciate you giving us the insight into that fantastic footage and opportunity, as you say, in regards to being part of something so unique. I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's been, I think, from my point of view, kind of groundbreaking in what was being achieved within that. But as yeah. you say, it was a collaboration as well of lots and lots of different creators coming by. And one other I want to mention, which was Levi, all yep. of a sudden, then I see Levi, and here he is, and he's swinging from the rafters, and he's creating. Yeah. I'm like, hang on, was he? Did he know you were recording that that day? He wasn't just in the area on that day. Like, I mean, I was like, no, ah. he, he actually came. He he lives on the other side of the country, um, mm -hmm. which is actually it's like a four day drive. It's not just you know, it's Canada is a massive country, so yes. it's no small feat for him to have driven across. But um, uh, it's a, a very small community, so he has friends all along the way, and he'd done the whole road trip basically from Vancouver or, or British Columbia, rather, um, all the way to Ontario. And he just happened to be—he was actually parked his van in the that building and was sleeping there with his <laughs> wife and his baby um, for like a week. So he just happened to be there when when that wow. you know it, it wasn't a it was a, a bit of a coincidence, but it wasn't a coincidence that he appeared in the yeah, video. Well, yeah, he was, yeah. Such a collaboration of such awesome talent and such a fantastic result on the other end of it. So, yeah, thanks for giving us the insight. That was fantastic. And, uh, yeah, oh, look, pleasure. what I'd like to do here, I suppose, we'll take one final break and we'll be right back then. I've got a sequence of questions that I ask all guests, so I also want to ask you the same questions. So we'll be right back Looking forward after to this. It. 
you're enjoying this episode of the podcast, why not jump over to iTunes or Spotify and listen to the back catalogue that we have with some great episodes where we talk about photography, gear, and some excellent guests along the way. Thanks very much for listening and for watching. We'll see you in the next one. And you're very welcome back to the final part of the Irish Photography Podcast. And Christophe, like I mentioned to we have you know three questions that we ask all of our guests. So I want to include you obviously in those quest in those questions. And the first question is, like, what is a funny photography story? So, Christophe, what's a funny photography story of yours? Um, well, it's not photography; it's a, a Instagram clip. Hopefully, okay. that counts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, going back to how we used to use Instagram to kind of as like a testing ground for ideas mm-hmm. that we had, um, there was a week where uh, my friend Florence, who appears in a lot of the videos that I make, uh, it was just like a very inclement weather day, and uh, we saw on Twitter or Instagram or something that there was these waves really popping off at this pier that we sometimes shoot at. Okay. So we decided to go investigate, and this was in. It was probably in the winter. I want to say it was like March or something. So it's not a warm day here, mm-hmm. um, which is usually the perfect kind of environment for the, the lakes here to kind of really act up. Um, Come alive, yeah. And, and so we went and checked it out. And sure enough, you know, the waves were crashing up against this pier and making like 12 foot high, nice. you know, swells that would just like basically completely envelop the edge Everything. of the pier. And we got this idea that Florence should go and stand you know, in it, and I happened to have a like a high speed camera for another project at the time, so we sort of covered it in a garbage bag and then just filmed Florence just getting annihilated by these waves, um, and the footage was epic. And we made a uh, you know if you go back deep into I think it was in 2017, there's a post of Florence kind of just getting completely drenched and it's like slow motion and water droplets, you know, wh- whizzing past them in slow motion and it just looks incredible. Beautiful, yeah. Um, but they almost got hypothermia as a result. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Florence has always been basically, you know, down for any anything that I throw at them. And, you know, if we come up with a crazy idea, they're always down to just go for it and, and give 110%, even if it means potentially putting their own health in, at risk. Yes. Um, and kind of a, f- a funny little follow-up to that is, uh, so Florence was also the one that was featured running through the forest in that forest shot, which was something mm-hmm. that we shot around the same time, like three or four years ago. Um, and there's a new video for, um, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Sean Mendez, who's like another yep. Canadian, another Canadian R and B artist or or pop artist, I guess, mm-hmm. um, and it features him running through the forest, uh, which I can't say was an original idea. Like we did get that from that that uh, Sherlock Holmes movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and my wife was watching it, and she was like, "Oh, this is so weird. It's so much like the video that Christoph and Florence made of Florence running through the forest." <laughs> uh, and, and she's like, "Oh, it must just be a coincidence." And then uh, in the video, Sean Mendez like emerges from the forest and runs up to this edge of this cliff, and all of a sudden these waves start crashing up and completely <laughs> enveloping him in slow motion, you know, in the waves. And she was like, "No way! Like Florence and Christoph did that too." Um, but I Class. looked and I checked to see if the director, like if we had any mutual friends or anything, and we didn't. So it's probably just a coincidence. Coincidental, but, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, that was that's my funny story for today. <laughs> class, <laughs> class, class. And I suppose you know something else as well then that we think about, and we've kind of touched on it there a couple of times during this conversation is the different things that you can use to create the content that you create. So mm-hmm. I suppose I would imagine over the the breadth of your career, you've gone through a number of different iterations of camera gear, video gear, and stuff like that. But right mm-hmm. now, what gear do you use? So what's not in your bag, but you know what do you use on a daily basis from a, a, a shoot point of view yeah um so because uh because i do a lot of like feature films and higher end commercials and stuff um i've been able to acquire some pretty uh like i have a red epic which is kind of my workhorse camera mm-hmm. um, which i absolutely love it's a it's actually a really old camera and i bought it second hand because that was the only way i could afford it mm-hmm. um but it's like a five or six year old camera and it still holds up really well um by today's standards um and that, that allows me to use something that's way overqualified for the kind of content that I make for Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, but I get to have it in my kit, which is which is cool, and I'm very grateful awesome. for that. Awesome. For, drone, for drones, my, my go-to, I have an Inspire 2, but I rarely use it. I actually use my Mavic 2 Pro mm-hmm. all the time. I think it's just the fact that I can just keep it in my backpack, you know, and the quality is, is amazing. Um, for 99% of what I do, it's just Mavic 2 Pro. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I love that drone. I don't really see myself needing to replace it. You know, if they come out with a Mavic 3, 
Um, you know, it kind of does everything I need it to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then my most recent uh, foray into the FPV thing, that's become my new obsession. Um, and uh, thankfully, I'm starting to book work with FPV drones. So it's justifying all of the money that I've sunk into the hobby. <laughs> justifying um, your gas. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that's one that it's like you could, you know, I, I always tell people you need about two. 2000 or 2500 bucks to kind of get into it but expect to, to pay double when it's all said and done because it's you know r repairs and you know constantly yeah, upgrading sure. things and stuff yeah um but uh yeah i've lost track of how much uh how much money i've spent on that one and, and hopefully it all you know comes around in the end hopefully so hopefully so and i suppose yeah. i'm going go, going back to the red there what glass have you got in the red is it canon or is it sigma glass yeah, I um, so I actually tested both uh, for a, the first feature that I did. I needed to buy a set of proper lenses, essentially, and uh, I tested the Sigma primes. They have like their Cinema primes and mm -hmm. the uh, the Canon ones, which I'd already used a few times, and I really liked the Canon. So I kind of tested them against each other, and in the end, I really preferred the look of the Canons, and you know they're. Um, so the Canon CNE Cinema Primes, I have a set of, uh, there's a 14, 20, 24, 35, 50, 85, and 135, and they're superb. Like, they're super sharp, they have, you know, they have some character, um, and they just resolve really nicely on the, the RED camera. So yeah, I love those lenses. Yeah, and I suppose, and the other question I have for you on the RED camera is, how much storage do you go through? Like, from oh, a... Lots. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the the drive or the mags for the RED cameras are really expensive. They're like $2,000 each. So I only have two of them, um, which is probably not enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Like every time we're doing bigger projects, I have to rent extra ones. Um, but yeah, you'll easily, you know, in a day of shooting, we'll shoot a terabyte of footage wow. without even without even trying. Yeah, it's wow. a lot of data. <laughs> so even, even from the storage of that on your system then as well, you must have what? Like ridiculous amount of even RAID systems or even more so to be able to deal with all that footage even archiving that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Uh, well, so the nice thing is a lot of the stuff that I shoot, I don't do post on. I'm just hired as a cinematographer. Perfect. Yeah. So the footage gets handed off to an editor and I never have to you know, <laughs> worry about it. But I do like to archive things that I've shot. So if I, you know, if I'm cutting a demo reel. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I've probably got about 100 terabytes of and I don't even have I don't have a RAID system. I literally just buy these like cheap, you know, mm -hmm. $50 drives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just put a project on that and then hope for the best kind of thing. And then, you know, most <laughs> wow. The time I don't I don't need it, but I just have it there if I wanted to you know go back and revisit yeah, that footage. It. And um, plus, if you if you do go back, you know that footage is going to be. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's sure. an unbelievable, unbelievable piece of gear. Yeah. You know, I I've actually only ever held one once. I've never even filmed with or anything like that. So yeah, I think. Oh really? Yeah, and I think you know, an interesting question actually. Just as a slight kind of a side note, what do you think mm -hmm. of this new um, Sony that has just been released? There is it the R something six or R something like that? Oh, so yeah, so Sony this year. This year was a crazy year for cameras. Um, so Sony finally, you know, years later released the A seven S three, and then Canon had the R five and the R six, which mm -hmm. were like the professional versions of the the EOS R. Um, and they're all phenomenal cameras. I think if anything was going to, I mean, I'm not going to be buying one because I'm, I'm feel pretty good with the gear that I've got mm -hmm, in terms mm -hmm. of actual cameras right now. But the a seven S three is, is kind of where I would, if I was going to, uh, you know, pick up another mirrorless camera, that would be the one I would go with. That being said, my wife is a wedding photographer and I, you know, we bought an R6 for her just because she's already a Canon shooter and it was really mm -hmm. easy for her to make this. She was shooting on 5D Mark threes for the longest time mm -hmm. and had like long, they were long past their prime by a long shot. Mm -hmm. and it was time for her to upgrade and uh, the R6 was the, the best choice for her. So, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the R6 is a phenomenal camera, actually. And even from a handheld point of view with the image stabilization built yeah. in and combine that with the Canon L glass with a stabilization. I mean, yeah, I I've, I recently changed. I, I had a 6D and I said, OK, it's time for me to finally come out of the dark ages and finally go into the latest technology. And I actually ended mm -hmm. up going for the EOS R, believe it or not, as yeah. opposed to the R6 or the R5. And I actually made a video as to why it was more important for me is because it ticked more boxes for what I needed it for. Mm -hmm. But... The R6 is just a phenomenal um, piece of equipment. Yeah. I have a friend of mine, again, he's a, he's a phenomenal landscape photographer, and he's taking a lot of photographs as well, handheld now with the R6, that he'd mm -hmm. never even thought of before. So Yeah, yeah just because uh, of the stabilization, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Phenomenal, phenomenal. So, okay, and then the final, I suppose, of my staple questions really is, you know, we have a regular segment here called a VSP. It's a very solid product. It's a product that you, you know, if you could put your name to it, you'd put your name to it. Or you'd recommend, I wouldn't lose, leave home without it. So, mm -hmm. what's your VSP, Christophe? Honestly, I think the, I've thought about this a lot recently because it, it kind of just blew my mind how much mileage I've gotten out of this one product. Okay. Um, more than anything that I use is my Mavic 2 Pro. Because mm -hmm. I've had it for probably, like, I've had it since it came out. So that's two or three years now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it cost maybe $1,500 Canadian at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's paid for itself a thousand times over. Like, that's my workhorse in terms of the drone stuff I do, which is a big chunk of the work that I get. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's owed me nothing within a few weeks of, of purchasing it, and it continues to deliver. Um, so I do hope that eventually they come out with a new version and they build on the quality um, of the uh, of that one, but there isn't far to go. Like it's it's basically yeah. a perfect drone camera. Is, yeah. Um, and yeah, in terms of like all of the gear I own, like my red camera is amazing. My lenses, I love my lenses and everything. But in terms of the one piece of gear that's probably uh, made me the most money and gets used the most, the the Mavic Two Pro by a long shot. Yeah, it's a phenomenal piece of kit. Phenomenal piece yeah. of kit. Yeah, and like even as you say, like you've got the Inspire. But mm -hmm. even at that, you, you, you need a suitcase to carry the Inspire around with you. And it yeah. is a commitment. And it, I, I remember, you know, meeting a friend of mine down in a place, uh, we'll talk in a moment actually, I suppose, about Ireland, but, you know, a place called Killarney in Ireland. And I, he had the Inspire and I wanted to go, I want to see what this is like. And he said, yeah, no problem, I'll bring it out. <laughs> And he arrived with the suitcase, and I'm like, yeah. all right, okay. He said, what else is in there? He said, no, that's just the drone. I went, Do you know, like, so you kind of committed to using the Inspire if you bring it with you on a shoot, because you don't want to mm -hmm. drag it all the way to somewhere and not use it. Whereas yeah. the, the Mavic 2 Pro, you have that in the bag. You need it, bang, yeah. quick, instant, you're done, and it's back. And, and I also find I fly my Mavic 2 differently than I fly the Inspire because, you know, you're very, when you're flying the Inspire, you're very aware of how much money you spent on that thing, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's, it's hard to shake that feeling. Whereas with the Mavic at this point, I could have crashed it 15 times and bought a new one and it would still, you know, owe mm -hmm. me nothing because mm -hmm. of, you know, it's, well, it's, it's able to great for you. Yeah, exactly. It's a fraction of the cost. So you fly it differently because you're not as paranoid about crashing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, no, very, very good product. You know, very, very good, I suppose, recommendation. And again, from somebody, you know, if they're even a photographer, mm -hmm. a drone can change it completely. Never mind, say, from a oh, filmmaking yeah. point of view. And as you say, with the Mavic 2 Pro, I mean, it's really, really good image quality. Um, mm -hmm for what you can actually get to be able to get that elevated view, to get that view that you haven't thought about and actually to be ahead of the game, let's just say, to be able to think about something and going, yeah, not only did I think about it, but now when I wanted to get the shot, it's mm -hmm. good quality. You're not going to be, yeah. you know, disappointed. You're not compromising. Here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So look, yeah, there's my, my three staple questions. You survived them. So yeah, very good answers as well. Thank you very much for that. I'd agree with you, I suppose, like I say, with the VSP, because the, the, the drone is phenomenal, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, maybe a slight caveat to that, I suppose, from my point of view, I didn't actually end up going for the Mavic 2 Pro. I ended up going for the Mavic Air 2. And the reason I went for that just purely was because from the video point of view, I said, okay, it's very, very similar. However, it is 48 megapixel stills. And yeah. I went, okay. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I know, know so. just that a lot of the time-lapse stuff that I do with the drone, it's almost made me go that route because of the, the quality of that camera. It's unbelievable that you're getting that on like a tiny little drone camera. Yeah, but it, it, it's a bit of a jiggery-pokery, you know. It's a bit of kind of, uh, what's the word? Jiggery poker, I suppose the easiest way to describe <laughs> it. I mean, it combines four images, 12 megapixel sensor into the 48 megapixel. So mm. it's not actually the sensor being the bigger, as you say, oh, it's gotcha. a smaller one, you know. I didn't um, know that. Huh. Yeah, so that's what I found, I suppose, one challenge with it. But unless you're in, which most of the time in Ireland I'm not, unless you're in very, very still conditions, even the slightest bit of movement within that split second, it can mm. be a, a bit of a challenge. But yeah, from the Mavic 2 Pro though. Beats, beats my Mavic Air 2 from an image quality all day long. Yeah, all day mm. long. So, yeah, you know, I suppose, Christoph, you know, for me, it's been fantastic chatting to you. I really, really enjoyed, you know, getting, I can say, into your head and your creative process and what you do is actually phenomenal. Um, and I suppose one question for you, you know, we've mentioned briefly in chatting and such like that, you have a sister who lives in Ireland. Have you mm -hmm. visited Ireland? Have you plans once, we, once the whole world goes back to normal, of course, but have you ever plans to come mm -hmm. visit Ireland? Absolutely. I haven't been yet. Um, 
she moved there. She's been there for two years now. And obviously half of that now basically has been the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my parents just got back from visiting because they recently had a baby and they mm-hmm. wanted to meet their first grandchild. Um, mm-hmm. So they, you know, suffered the whole two week quarantine when they got there and then were able to stay for two weeks and then came back and quarantined here for two weeks. Mm-hmm. So it's a, you know, it's a six week uh, investment yeah. at the end or commitment at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to do that yet, but we do have intentions of getting out there. My wife, uh, she has, uh, like her background is Irish and Scottish. Okay. So she really wants to get out there, um, to be able to, you know, connect, reconnect. She's never been to Europe before. Um, uh, that's not true. Actually, she did just go, uh, two years ago to the UK and, um, but that was the first time she's never been to Ireland though. And she's never been to Scotland. Um, so it's definitely something that we would like to do as soon as that becomes a viable option again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ireland, I suppose like, of course I'm going to say Ireland is beautiful because I'm Irish and I'm proud of my country, but I suppose, Mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned earlier on about Canada and the size of Canada. Whereas you look at Ireland, Ireland is is a little dot. It doesn't even Mm -hmm. register on most of the maps, let's just say, but we have got so much here that it really does pack above, you know, pack above its weight, let's just say, from the whole coast, if you're into yep. seascape photography, you know, okay, we don't have mountains, we do have mountains, we call them mountains, but they're hills, I mean, but, you know, our That's highest like mountain, here. yeah, our, our highest mountain is, is uh, 1,100 meters, um, mm-hmm. so, you know, I mean, it's, it's not giant, but at the same point, you can get the experience of the mountain, but, I mean, for such a small area, if you ever do come and visit, of course, give me a shout, and I'll let you know, obviously, oh, places yeah, to absolutely. go, you know, uh, I'd love it, but, I mean, it's so really, really nice. You can get so much in such a short place. But there's one caveat I will tell you, give you a bit of advice. Whatever the sat nav tells you, double it. Because you will be stopping every so often, as every so often, as every so often, to go and go, wow, look at this. Wow, look at that. Wow, look at this. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's something that, you know, we find quite a lot when somebody visits Ireland that they're spending more time going off the beaten track Mm -hmm. then they actually planned to go on the track of where they were actually going to, you know? Yeah, along the way. You have to budget an extra day or two for every day trip, I guess. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, and not not only that, but the roads as well. I mean, look, you know, our roads are small. (laughs) Small. Mm really really small like, you know, okay really really small i mean especially <laughs> when you start going into the kind of rural areas and you might think mm-hmm. this is a two-way road really Uh-oh. yeah <laughs> yeah but that's, that's all part of the charm it's all part of the culture i suppose you know so yeah. Yeah. our road started when there was horse and carts so that's why the roads are so right. small you know yeah yeah no i saw the photos my parents you know they got back a couple of weeks ago and we went through all the photos and obviously my sister was posting stuff online so i was mm-hmm. seeing all that and mm-hmm. the landscape looks incredible there i would really love to to get yeah. out there and bring my fpv drone with me <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah exactly it would be fantastic yeah. so yeah hopefully when the world goes back to a bit of normality you know we love to see mm-hmm. on the, the the green grass of Ireland. let's just say so yeah yeah um Christoph, I suppose final two questions for you, you know, like what's next for you and where can people find more information to well, to see the awesomeness of your work? If they haven't really mm-hmm. got a picture painted from what we've discussed here today, where can they sure, find yeah. more as well? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's next for me in terms of the cinematography thing? I've, I've got a bit of a break now. So I just finished up a movie a, co- uh, a week ago. And, um, and so now I'm, you know, spending the next couple of months just working on some personal things and Brilliant. that'll hopefully result in some new YouTube videos and some more Instagram posts, uh, before I go back to, uh, in March, I'm starting on a TV show. So I'll be keeping me, bu- keeping me busy for a solid three months, which means very minimal, uh, so like online presence mm-hmm. <laughs> for that three month mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of finding my work, uh, I'm on Instagram, I'm at C um, which is just my first initial and my last name. Uh, nothing too crazy there. And mm-hmm. on YouTube, uh, our channel's called Maybe Someday. And that's a channel that I share with, with a few friends where we just upload tutorials and filmmaking tips and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And actually, one thing I meant to ask you as well is your studio is called Low Key Studios, which I love the name of because it's kind mm-hmm. of like, yeah, we'll keep it low key. But what we'll yeah. give you is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. I like I, that. Kind of goes back to my mentality of setting the bar low for people, and then kind of that way it's easier to exceed it. <laughs> Which yeah. maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's not. But you know, that's kind of usually my approach is to not is to undersell and then over deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you've certainly done that with the work that I've been following anyway as well. So yeah, I'm really like I said, I'm honored to have you on the Irish Photography Podcast. I've really, really enjoyed the conversation that we've had, and uh, yeah, there's an open invitation for you for Ireland. I know you're going to come over to see your sister 
at some point. But even yeah. regardless, we'll, we'll have our arms open and we'll give you a Cade Meal of Falchie, which is 100,000 welcomes into Ireland. Um, oh, I look forward come. to that. So, yeah, no. Christoph, yeah. thank you very, very much. Um, you know, for me in Ireland, to you in the beautiful Canada in Toronto, I have a phrase in Ireland, which is the Irish for buy for now, which is Schlange Fall. Schlange Fall. Oh, very <laughs> good. I didn't, did I butcher it? Or? No, you got it bang on. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, oh, it was, was good. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah Brilliant. No, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks, man. No, I really enjoyed it. Thanks a million. Yeah, perfect. Hey, guys. If you dig what you're hearing, why don't you jump over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating, and don't forget to share with your friends. With all that done, We'll see you next week, and remember, keep shooting.